All righty. Um, so we want to talk about um, the uh, chi-square test of independence today. So in chapter three, uh, we are looking at count data. But again, count data isn't, you know, it could have been uh, numerical data uh, like a scatter plot, but then we just um, came up with a, a grid um, on that, and we'll look at that in a minute. But so let's look at two variables. So um, we want to look at uh, both uh, a two variable case, um, which is very similar to the early part of the chapter where they talk about comparing two proportions. And, uh, and then, but we also want to look at, at the single variable case where we're comparing to a, a particular known uh, item uh, or a known proportion. But actually, I, I think it's a little better to start with the um, uh, uh, independence case of two variables. And so I thought, well, uh, I wanted something with just two categories in each variable. And so usually when you do that, you can go with gender or sex or, or whatever. And um, so, you know, we've got uh, male and female. That's, that's a nice way to split things into two usually. Um, and then uh, I thought looking at movie types or movie genres or something like that. And... Um, comedy and uh, drama. Um, now I'm curious, uh, I might not go with what you tell me just because I, I've picked some numbers here, but, uh, but I'm curious. Um, let's see, we will go with Chloe. Um, what do you think with males, uh, like, which they like better, comedy or drama? Comedy. comedy. You think they like them way better than dramas? Yeah, probably. So uh, that's what we came up with on Tuesday. And, and so we'll say, okay, we ask uh, uh, a bunch of males and it was like 60 to 20. Okay, so there were a total of 80 respondents there. And then Serenity. How about females? What do you think? They're going to probably like drama way better or a little better? Probably way better. Way better. Okay, Tuesday they said a little better. So, yeah. Well, because about romance and drama kind of falls into the same Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, just for these numbers, I went with um, uh, 50 and 70. There were 120 asked. And... Yeah, you know, it's not as pronounced as, as the, what we have in the male numbers there, but definitely, you know, we're going with, ah, they, they you know, that's what we think. Yeah. And maybe you went out and you got these actual data, and then that's uh, 110, and uh, 110? Yeah, no, 90. I'm not very good with numbers. Uh, 90, and... Um, total of 200. So even in the two proportion case, you may have been uh, given a table like this and um, we might be looking at, we could pick one, either comedy or drama and, and ask, you know, do we think these two proportions, the proportions of males who like comedy and the proportion of females who like comedy, do we think those are the same? That would be a two-proportion question. Um, and, and so you could have something like this that, you know, oh, uh, the proportion of males who like comedy is uh, 60 out of 80. Uh, I'm going to call it P hat because it's a data thing. And... Um, uh, so that's three-fourths. Uh, 
And then uh, female, uh, the proportion of females who like comedy is 50 out of 120, uh, which is 5 twelfths. And so we have that. And then typically with something like this, even if what you're thinking is, oh yeah, those are different, our, our hypothesis test would be that we're going to assume they were the same. Okay, that's a, that's a test of two proportions. And, and so our null hypothesis would be that um, PM minus uh, PF is equal to zero. Okay, so that's one way to say they're the same. If I subtract them, I get zero. And the alternative would be that uh, PM minus PF is not equal to zero. And we would go through and we would calculate uh, a Z statistic. We would calculate a normal random variable uh, to try to determine, well, how likely are these numbers for these particular values of N and so forth. Um, and uh, we would compute an answer. Now, the thing is, um, I'm just, I, so I, I really don't know why the books so much keep doing this uh, other than um, history. And, and so the last book mentioned this, and so the next, you know, and they think like, well, we can't leave it out. Well, actually, they could, okay? So we can leave this out um, this way because, you see, when we talk about this proportion, 60 over 80, there's actually another proportion that's hiding there, right? 20 over 80. There's really, in this two, what they call this two-proportion test, there are really four proportions hanging out in there. Right? There's the 60 over 80, the 20 over 80, the 50 over 120, and the 70 over 120. And with this particular test, this is it. This is all I can do. However, um, with what we're going to look at today, the chi-square test of independence, well, I can do this same problem, and I will get exactly the same p-value as I would doing this method. Okay, so I can use this chi-square method on this same set of data here. But the chi-square method is expandable to, you know, we could, in, in this method, I really could only ask about two categories, comedy and drama, or male and female. But now, um, under the chi-square test of independence, heck, I can ask comedy, drama, um, I don't know, horror, there's another one, horror one, right, you know, uh, and, and then some sort of shoot em up something, war movie or something like that, right, so I could add those categories, I can't do it under this, okay, but the technique we're going to look at, we can do that, and the same thing, you know, if, if you want to go here, you know, I'm going with that simple idea of male, female, uh, but if it made sense for whatever you were working with, uh, maybe some social data or something like that, you can go with gender and split that up into more than two categories. And, uh, you know, and so um, I, I really, I'm not sure why we bother with this anymore. And notice we, we haven't really worried too much about it. Um, uh, but it is in your text, so just so you realize that's there. Uh, so let's look at what we do with these kind of data. Um, so now I want to talk about that this, these four sets, you know, this could actually be numerical data that, you know, somehow, I mean, it doesn't really make sense with the categories here, but um, think of it sort of this way that those 
four regions, if I had numerical data that I was counting, it could say that, oh, there were 60 data points up in here somewhere. Okay, I had a whole bunch of data points up there. Then there were only 20 in here. So it wouldn't like, look like near as many there. And then there were 50 data points down here. Now, a lot could matter as to where they were actually sitting. I mean, if they were all, you know, sort of squeezed in here, we would see a, a, a definite trend. Um, and then there were 70 here, so there were even more here than there were in any of the others. Okay, and now thinking about a scatter plot like that, you know, I could ask, um, do we think there is either an upward or downward trend? I don't know, it's actually kind of hard to tell with this one. Okay, if I had very little data in here, then I would definitely say there appeared to be a downward trend as I moved to the right. And that would be saying, oh, these are dependent. In other words, again, it, it makes a difference. If I know I'm here, I would guess that most of the data were up there. If I were here, I would guess that most of the data were down here. Okay, that's dependency. I change my outlook sort of on where I think the data are or what the numbers are or something like that as far as a prediction. Now here, eh, it's a little tougher to say because they're you know, about the same number here and here, uh, but definitely not there. So I don't know, I think there's probably a downward trend, but I'm not sure. But then you see if you had data like this, you could, you know, quarter it like that and then just simply make the counts and say, oh yeah, you know, I've got uh, so many here, so many there, so many there, so many there, and count them up and put them in a box like this. Same, you know, they're really showing the same kind of thing. It's just here, um, you know, with categorical data, no, it wouldn't be spread out like this, right? Because it's a single category, a single category. All the dots would be in one place. Okay, but if it were numerical to start with, they might be spread out like this, but you could count them all up and put them into something like that. So this is really, you know, this box is reflecting something very similar as you might see in a scatter plot. Okay, but different types of data. So all categorical. And, and so that's uh, um, what we're, we're working with here. And so, you know, as I look at this though, you know, I do see that, yeah, it appears if you tell me the person is male, I'm going to guess, oh yeah, of the two, they like comedy, at least according to this data. But if you tell me the person is female, I'm probably going to guess drama. Even though they're closer together, drama still wins. And even if this was, say, um, there are 120 here, 61 to 59, you know, 61 here, 59 there, oh, well, I might still predict comedy, but even then, um, you could say my prediction changes because I'm much more confident if you tell me male. I'm much less confident if you tell me female, if they're really close together in the female. So, so even then, I'm changing my prediction or how I make my prediction. And so they, they appear like they might be dependent. Well, so what we want to do is determine how likely it is um, that if they were independent, how likely could I come up with these numbers? So what we have to do is compare this table to a similar table where it's perfectly independent. And we can make one like that. You know, so uh, a table that's perfectly independent, if I look across this row and compare it with this row, the proportions, the relative proportions uh, compared to these ends would look exactly the same. 
So here, you know, this one's three quarters. If this were a perfectly independent table, well, I guess this one would also be three quarters of that one. Or, you know, this is five twelfths, then this one would be five twelfths of that one. Any questions about that? You know, you know, independent would mean that the rows look the same. I don't, I don't gain any information by looking, you know, by knowing which row I'm in. Here I do, it looks like. But the question is, well, could I have come up with those data even if uh, male and female were independent? It, it didn't matter. Okay, so we need to make such a table. So here is um, what we call our expected uh, table. And it is always a perfectly independent table. And so it's, it's made the same way uh, in that it's um, going to be comedy and drama, uh, male, female, Now, the way we make it is we take the totals at the edges and we say, oh, okay, that's 80, that was 120, I had 200 people total, and uh, what, 110 of them liked comedy and 90 liked drama. So that's, um, uh, that's how we make our table, and now, uh, what we want to do is say, well, okay, to, to make these proportions the same, and actually I, could, I can do it uh, sort of um, uh, either by row or by column, doesn't matter. But here, you know, I can say, well, okay, according to this, 80 out of 200, that's like 40 out of 100, so 40%. Okay, 40% of uh, those liking comedy should be male and 60% should be female. And you see the way I'm getting that is, well, that's what the overall is. And so if I make that happen here and here, okay, 40% and 60% and do it here and here, we're going to see that we get the same proportions every time. So, uh, because, you know, it's, uh, this is kind of turning around the other way, is, um, you know, 40% male, 60% female. Well, if I tell you comedy or drama, but if they're both 40% uh, male, 60% female, um, it doesn't matter which one of those you tell me. I'm going to, I'm going to guess with sort of a certainty of the, knowing the population is 60, 40, 60% 60 female, 40% male, I'm going to guess female. Because they're the majority. Okay? And that's what it means to be independent. It doesn't matter which one you tell me. I get the same answer either way. And similarly, we could go the other way. The numbers are just a little harder to deal with. Okay, 55% and 45%. Okay. Um, so, how do I get, you know, how do I make sure this is 40% and that's 60%? Well, take 40% of 110 and 60% of 110. Okay, so uh, I'm going to write this, but then I'm going to erase the 0.4. Okay, so 40% is 0.4 times that 110 and 0.6 times that 110. Okay, now I'm going to erase those though because how did I get 0.4? I got, I took 80 over 200. Oh, 80 over 200 and 120 over 200. 
And then I want to do the same thing here. I want 40% of 90 and 60% of 90. And so I'll do 80 times 90 over 200 and 80, uh, sorry, 120 times 90 over 200. And that's how I get my expected numbers. Okay, and so if you just look at that formula when you first see it, you're kind of going, why the heck would you take that number times that number divided by that number? Right? But if you think about it as, well, I'm taking the 80 divided by the 200 to get my 40%. Oh, there's my 40% of 110. And 60% of 110. And 60% of 110. So it's, it's not really that deep an idea. I mean, it just, yeah, that's how the numbers work out. And then, uh, but you could also look at it the other way. This is, I want 110 out of 200 for this column and 90 out of 200 for this column or 55% and 45%. Well, how would I get um, my 55% uh, of 120? Oh, well, there's 110 over 200, that's 55% times the 120. And then 90 over 200 is the 45% times the 120. Yeah, it, it works out in this nice pattern. And you see, as I add um, more ca columns, well, I just do the same thing. So I just look, you know, this column uses 110. This row uses 80. And then this column uses 90. The bottom row uh, uses 120 in, in, in the top. And they all use the total down there uh, as the denominator, every single one. And so um, that's how we get a perfectly independent table. Uh, in this table, if you tell me male, or female, it didn't, doesn't help me determine, you know, which I'm going to get, you know, comedy or drama. If you tell me comedy or drama, it doesn't help me determine which I'm going to get, male or female. It doesn't change my prediction whatsoever. Okay, so it's independent. It gives me no extra information. And so that's the expected table. And so what we want to do is once we get that expected table, now I'm going to rewrite it here. So uh, comedy, drama, male, female. And when you uh, multiply all that out, what you get is uh, 44, 36, and 66, and 54, and uh, 80. 120, 200, 110, and 90. And so, you know, if you, if you look at these numbers then, you see proportionally this row is just like that row. 44 is 55% of 80, 66 is 55% of 20. You know, or another way to look at it is 44 is 40% uh, of 110, 66 is 60% 60 of 110. And then the 36 and 54 work that way with the 90. Same proportions. And so that is our null hypothesis distribution of uh, movies, movie type, and uh, gender there. Okay, so this, this is our null hypothesis, our assumed distribution of how things work. Here's the data we got. And what we want to do is just compare those two and ask, oh, how likely could I have gotten these data? Uh, to do that, to compute a p-value, we do assume a normal distribution uh, to do our calculations. Um, 
I have to uh, look at some, I, I was, well, not that you really, on the whole, probably care, but um, uh, as we do this, I, you know, I want to kind of point out um, how it is a normal distribution, but actually, I've got to look at something. It's been a while since I, I've tried to uh, derive this, and um, I did get stuck on one thing as to why it works this way. And uh, but let's just look at our chi-square number. So there's a chi-square. And um, to get our chi-square number, all we do is we look at the difference between this table and that table. Okay, so 60 minus 44. Okay, but again, well, if, if I do 60 minus 44 and add to that, say, 20 minus 36 and 50 minus 66 and 70 minus 54, actually, I'll get zero. Okay, it's a lot like doing the standard deviation variance stuff, is that if you don't do anything to these and you just say, well, I want to look at all these um, differences, add them up, well, you will get zero, okay? Because of the way this is made, it just, it will be zero. Um, so, yeah, at least we need to do an absolute value or something. Well, statisticians, mathematicians have looked at this for a very long time, and uh, what they've determined is a very good way to go with this is we'll square it. Now, here's the sort of weird part, right? We're going to divide by 44. Okay, so that's our first term. We took our data minus our expected value. We squared that, and we divided by um, the expected value. Okay, where the heck did that come from? I, I think that deserves a little bit of where the heck did that come from. Um, okay, if you look at it this way, so you don't square everything. If you look at it this way, actually, this looks a lot like uh, the normal distribution calculations we've had to do. Okay, because here, this 60 is, if I take that proportion, right, 60 over 80, that's 3 fourths or 0.75. Uh, but if I take the proportion, 0.75 that I found times n, the 80, I get that number. So you see, this part is a lot like n times p hat. This part is a lot like n times p0, or a hypothesized proportion. And then this part, square root of n times uh, p0. Now, if if you do a little math and you um, uh, factor out the n and so forth, uh, what you get is uh, p hat minus p0 over uh, the square root of p0 over n. The only place this is sort of lacking from what you did in the first part of chapter three is we don't have a one minus P zero in there. Okay, that's the only difference in what you did for uh, testing a, a, a single proportion and, and to determine your Z value. It turns out this is indeed an, a, 0, 1, normal, random variable, okay? This, this is just like the proportions before. Now, what makes it more complicated is we're tossing in these other proportions. 
And, and that's why it turns out we don't need the 1 minus P0 here. It gets taken care of over here. Okay? But I, I think even though in many ways you absolutely probably don't care, okay, that's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm all right with that. But I, I think it's, you still need to kind of see that we're still just dealing with this normal distribution thing. Okay? This, this is not that mysterious, at least in the sense of, you know, if you've decided this is okay, um, then this is not that mysterious. And the way we should have decided this is okay is we did some numerical experiments and saw that a normal distribution um, actually, you know, doing this with a normal distribution looked a lot like our real life data. Oh, well, okay. So the normal distribution is an approximation, uh, but um, it works. And we've got a lot of tools to, to allow us to work with it. And so, you know, this is, um, this is just showing us that, yeah, we still aren't straying from the normal distribution. We're still just using the normal distribution, but we're squaring it. And when you do that, that turns out to be called a chi-square distribution. So that's all a chi-square distribution is, is you start with a normal distribution of numbers, 0, 1, uh, standard normal, and then whatever you get, you square it. What would that look like? Oh, well, it looks like this chi-square. Okay, so that's all that's going on here, and um, and what we do then is we do this for every box uh, of our data, not the the margins here, not the outside, but every interior box. So I add to that my 20 minus uh, 36 squared over uh, 36 plus uh, 50 minus 66 squared over something, 66. I should be able to look right there and see it. I don't know why I can't do that, but anyway. Uh, and then 70 minus 54 uh, squared over 54. And that is our chi-square number. You add that up, and then you look it up in a table. Just like, you know, you got a, a Z value and you had to look that up in a normal table. Now, we don't actually have to uh, go look in a table. And actually, our textbook, again, this is one of these things. I, I think that's a really good textbook. And I think the authors hit on a lot of good things. Um, but there are some things that I just don't understand why they didn't do it. And so, for instance, the chi-square distribution, if you look up that table, um, we can't actually solve our problem. We can't find a p-value for this in our table um, because this has one degree of freedom. We'll look at that in a minute. But it has one degree of freedom. They don't put those entries in the table in, in your book. I don't know why not. It's strange. Um, but they don't. And, and so they sort of force you, if you're looking up stuff in a table, they force you to do the two proportion test because that's the only way you can get a p-value. But um, our template that we're, we are making or have made uh, for this, um, it'll take one degree of freedom just fine and, and calculate an answer. So uh, this is our chi-square number. And with that, I'm going to pull up the chi-square template that I, I believe is the same one that uh, you all are making. So um, here's our chi-square template. And uh, I'll put our numbers in. So I just need, I need to get rid of these numbers. And 60. Okay, this is a 60 and then a 20 and a 50 
and a 70. Okay, so I uh, put those numbers in, and once I have the template, uh, then, you know, if I come over here, you look down at the bottom, you can see uh, 110 and 90. And I guess I made it just slightly too big, uh, but it's 80 and 120 over there. Um, now we come down here and we see, you know, right there is our expected amount. So this makes the, the null independent table. Okay, but that's all it's doing is it's, it's making a table that has the same marginal numbers. Uh, so you come down here and they're still 110 and 90. Uh, I look out here and I still see 80 and 120. So it has the same marginal numbers, um, but it um, is independent. It is definitely independent. And so then uh, I come down here to get the z squared values that we did on the board. Um, I didn't multiply those out. And so the first one is 16 squared over 44. Uh, okay, 16 squared over 44. Well, that's the same thing as 16 times 4 over 11, because I can take a 4 out of the top and the bottom. So 16 times 4 is 64 divided by 11. Well, 66 divided by 11 is 6. So 64 divided by 11 should be a little bit less than 6. How about 5.8182? That's what I would guess, right? You know. So that's all that did. It just did the, the square of the difference and then divided by that um, uh, hypothesized number, 44. And we got our 5.8. Uh, we get those four numbers. We add them up. They add up to 21.5. What the heck does that mean? I don't know. I'd have to look it up. But that's what this does. Uh, there's the p-value, and it's... Uh, three over a million. Three times 10 to the negative sixth. So three over a million. Uh, pretty small p-value. Now, degrees of freedom, one. Okay, well, what the heck are the degrees of freedom? Well, we'll come back here and uh, talk about degrees of freedom. So for uh, degrees of freedom, uh, I think we can move that now. Uh, degrees of freedom are simple enough. Uh, again, they just end up having to do with, well, you know, what kind of distribution does it really look like um, once you uh, um, put all these numbers together. And uh, so if there are m rows and n columns, okay, our degrees of freedom, EF, is simply m minus 1 times n minus 1. And so since we had two rows, two columns, 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 times 1 is 1. So we got one degree of freedom. If I go to three columns uh, and two rows, now I get two degrees of freedom. You know, and, and so if I had you know, five columns, uh, four rows, my degrees of freedom would be the 5 minus 1 times 4 minus 1, or, uh, whoops, 12. 12 degrees of freedom. So that's all, you, you know, you just, you have to do that to get the right p-value, but uh, we do that. And now for this, we got a p-value of basically 0. 3 over a million. So tiny little p-value. What are we going with? Uh, no hypothesis or alternative hypothesis? Right. 
small p-value. This is the kind of thing I want you to just know and be able to snap off. Right. Small p-value, which hypothesis? Null or alternative? So anybody going to jump out there and say it? What's that? You said no. But today is opposite day, so what you really meant when you said that was alternative. Thank you for jumping out there with it. Yeah, it's the alternative because, again, the p-value, remember that the p-value is essentially saying or giving, right, p-value um, is... I'm going to go with essentially. I, you know, I, it's an interpretation. Okay, so it is essentially the likelihood of getting your data if the null hypothesis H0 is true. Okay? And so what we just said was, yeah, you had a chance of three in a million of doing that. Right? So we just had, we had three chances in one million that uh, our data came from the null distribution, okay, which is from the null hypothesis. And what it comes down to, I guess, Serenity, is I just don't think you're that lucky. <laughs> now, if you really are that lucky, I'm sending you out with a couple bucks to buy a lottery ticket for me. But, you know, but in the end, right, that's, that's what we're saying, is, is we are not that lucky that we could find data, we could have gone and gathered data that only had a three in a million chance of showing up. We, you know, none of us are going to do that. You know, how lucky do we have to be? Actually, pretty darn lucky. Real, I mean, well, sorry. How, how high a chance do we have to have? Well, really, I mean, a pretty high chance, I think, because the .05 is one in 20. You know, so if it's a one in 21 chance, that you could have gotten your data. We're going to say, no, I mean, you got your data. We believe your data. But there is no way it came from H0 being true. So when it's over that certain value, then you can go with the null Yeah, and you have to. Right. Okay? And again, what, what happens is the, the term or the phrase we fail to reject the null hypothesis is really the, the phrase you want. Because most of the time in these types of things, these types of experiments and so forth, you are absolutely hoping for a tiny little p-value. Okay, you want that, you want no chance that your data could have come from the null hypothesis. Okay, so, you know, here in context, probably what a person would have been out to do was to say there is a difference among genders in their, their choice of movie genre, right? That's what you wanted to say, probably. And, and so you, did a, you ran an experiment, you surveyed a bunch of males and females, about these two genres, and you got the data, and wow, it went the way you had hoped, was there is a difference, 
because um, there's no way they're the same. And, and again, the idea, um, uh, the null hypothesis, there are a few ways to talk about the null hypothesis. Now, in the, um, let me go back to that template, because what I put in the template was um, the null hypothesis is that each row's columns or column, each row or column, it doesn't matter which way you think of it, but each row's relative frequencies are the same. So if you go across one row and it goes, oh, 0.4, uh, 0.6, then the next, the null hypothesis says any row you look at would go 0 0.4, 0 0.6 as far as what's the proportion. Well, that, that your data definitely don't do that, but the question is, well, how likely could you have gotten these data if that's what's really going on? And we found not very likely. Okay, so since it's not likely, well, then we know our data is good. See, and this is, this is part of the logic here, is what could have gone wrong if we had such a small chance of getting these data? Well, it certainly wasn't my data collection I did that right. I mean, that's really the, the assumption there, is I did my data collection right. And so the only other thing that could have gone wrong was, oh, my null hypothesis was wrong. It's not really true. And so, oh, OK, we'll go with the alternative. H0 is not true. And. Um, and again, the, you know, so one way of looking at these chi-squares is um, each row uh, is basically the same if you were to divide through by the row sum. You would get the same proportions in, uh, in each column. I mean, not, you wouldn't necessarily get like 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, you know, but as you look down the rows, the proportion in row one is the same as the proportion in row two and so forth. And then you move to the next column, same thing. Uh, so that's one way to do it or say it. Um, the other way is to simply say, you know, H0, uh, the variables, the two variables we're looking at are independent. And so, well, if they're not independent, then the variables are dependent. And, of course, generally speaking, when you're doing an experiment, the reason you're doing it is you are hoping to see a dependency. Oh, we use this cancer drug, the cancer goes away. Now that's actually causal, right? You're looking at a cause there, but, but certainly you're, you want a dependency. Okay, so, um, you know, this is uh, one way of stating the null and alternative hypothesis, but looking at rows, uh, looking at rows and columns is another way, you know, that they should all look the same if you were to reduce them to their relative proportions. Now, chances are they won't, but that's the whole question of statistics. Well, how much different do they have to be for me to think they really are different? And that's where we use our chi-square number to get that. Okay, any, any questions at this point? Nope. Okay, well, I will see you next Thursday then.